Welcome Duke alumni and friends to this session of the Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute, an interdisciplinary educational program organized in a set of thematic courses. I'm Joe Superna, the Senior Director for Faculty Engagement with the Lifelong Learning Team at Duke Alumni Engagement and Development. And I'm really excited to have you join us for our program today, Thriving in a Digital Age. This program is part of our theme, Transformative Ideas, which is inspired by um, actual course that's by the same name that's open to Duke sophomores through Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. In the Transformative Ideas program, students explore questions of meaning, value, purpose, and the spirit that challenges us as humans. And during our Forever Learning Institute Transformative Ideas courses, you get to engage with the same ideas and questions as current Duke students with our outstanding faculty from across the disciplines. I'm really excited to introduce you to our moderator for today. Um, moderating our discussion is Alex Hardemeek, Professor of Computer Science uh, with Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. Alex, welcome to the Forever Learning Institute. Thank you, Joe. It's good to be here today. Thriving in the Digital Age was inspired by the sophomore year transformative ideas course that I'm teaching with a colleague this semester entitled Human Flourishing in a Digital Age. In that course, students are exploring how new technologies have made certain aspects of human flourishing easier and other aspects harder. The course is organized in three units. In the first unit, we start by asking, what is human flourishing? What does it mean for humans to flourish? And we read uh, from ancient voices like Plato and Aristotle, as well as more modern ones, to take up this question and to wrestle with what it means for humans to flourish. For many of our students, it's actually the first time that they consider this question at all. Many of them are familiar with accomplishment and achievement and success, but uh, not necessarily with the concept of flourishing. So this is really eye-opening to them. In the second unit, we look at different technologies that have impacted human flourishing through the centuries. So starting with the clock and the printing press and moving to the steam engine and the industrial revolution and continuing on to technologies like television, we consider technologies before the digital age and ask how did they enable human flourishing? What were some ways they possibly foreclosed on human flourishing? And we also developed some theories about technological change and how to interpret it more generally. So then in the third unit, armed with a better understanding of human flourishing, as well as examples and theories of technological change, we take up the question of human flourishing in the digital age. We break this up into a number of subtopics. And so we ask how in the digital age do we flourish at the personal or individual level in terms of our own character and formation? We also ask about friendships and close relationships. We talk about work and leisure. We also take up the question uh, at a broader scale of community and society, including political discourse. We're looking at ecological and environmental impacts of digital technology. And then in the final week, we ask about artificial intelligence, which is in the news quite a bit these days. And this opens up questions for us to consider what it means to be human. Today, our panel will discuss some questions inspired by this sophomore transformative ideas class. But the discussion today will be about their own research interests and how their research informs these types of questions. We'll consider how technology has enhanced many aspects of human life, but also has raised fundamental questions about the meaning and purpose of human life, and perhaps even made certain aspects of human flourishing harder. Before I introduce our panelists and we jump into a conversation together, uh, we wanna hear from you. You should soon see a poll appear on your screen. You'll have a little over a minute to respond. There are two statements. The first one is technology helps me to flourish. And the second one is technology helps society to flourish. Most people for both questions answered in a similar way, although maybe there's a little bit uh, more neutrality with respect to how technology uh, impacts society. Um, but overwhelmingly, there's a sense of agreement with um, technology and its impact on us as individuals and as a community. 
Joining me today in conversation are four of my faculty colleagues, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves to you in turn. Mark? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Hansen. I'm a, a professor in the program in literature and also in a, a small program called Computational Media Arts and Cultures, which um, brings in uh, artists and practitioners, mostly working in digital media, who want to develop a deeper research program that is guiding or will guide their practice moving forward. Um, so I really work, um, you know, on the kind of cusp between theorizing media and working with actual media um, to ask questions. I also run a lab called the S minus one speculative sensation lab, where we uh, where graduate students from this program, but also from my program and, and elsewhere um, get together and think together and also build projects together, um, exploring largely ways in which technologies um, extend human cognition and sensibility beyond uh, sort of perceptual awareness and um, what kind of possibilities, but also what kind of problems those um, those extensions bring in. Thank you. Uh, Philip. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Phil Napoli. I'm the James R. Shepley Professor of Public Policy uh, in the Sanford School, uh, where I'm also the director of the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy. The DeWitt Wallace Center is the home of the journalism and media minor here at Duke. Uh, so we, we, we teach broadly in the area of media and democracy. We do research here on issues like fact-checking, disinformation, um, you know, the plight of local journalism, uh, digital platform governance, uh, work in those areas. And apologies that we've caught me now at the exact moment where I have a, quite a film noir effect going, I know, uh, on my camera, but uh, give the sun about uh, two minutes to move and hopefully I'll look a little better. <laughs> Forgive me if I call you Sam Spade. Uh, Siobhan. Hello, um, I'm a professor of the practice in mechanical engineering and material science. Um, I uh, teach robotics courses um, and focus on research, including human-robot interaction, medical robotics, and robotics education. Um, I also teach a course um, of case studies in um, ethics and robotics um, and automation, and I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being with us. And finally, Nancy? I'm a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and psychology and neuroscience, and I direct the Duke Center for Eating Disorders. And um, my um, teaching involves teaching students to help run Duke Line, which is an anonymous text-based mental health support line where students take a course and are trained to provide um, text-based support to their peers. And then um, subsequent semesters actually um, coach their peers. It's a nightly line that I'm sure I'll be talking more about. Great. Thanks for being here, all of you. Um, and now we're going to come together as a group. Um, let me open up things by asking each of you to answer in turn. We'll start with Mark again. How would you react to those two statements in the poll yourself from the perspective of your own research and your own research interests? Yeah, um, well, so I'm speaking as a as a humanities scholar of media and a media theorist. Um, and uh, I guess it, it would be hard for me to answer these questions because I think that both flourishing and its opposite are part of the, you know, all technical developments. And uh, largely, that stems from a kind of uh, understanding of the relationship between humans and technologies that goes all the way back to the origin of the human, right? So, um, you know, humans develop together, you know, with ways of exteriorizing knowledge in language, but also in tools, initially in tools, right, in flint tools. So the idea is that humans have always evolved genetically, but also extra genetically through technologies and passing on those technologies. So in some ways, the w the way that I would approach that question is as a kind of a realist, right? That these technology, that technology and technological development are part of the way uh, the world evolves, but also the way human societies evolve. And, um, you know, the, for me, really, the questions are, um, are there better or are there worse ways to bring about um, technological change with relation to um, you know, contemporary digital technology. I mean, again, the way that that media theorists tend to look at technology is as a pharmacon, which is a Greek word that means both poison and its antidote, right? So the 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 or example of a technology is writing, right? Writing lets us exteriorize our memory, but at the same time, it induces us to to not be able to remember things, to lose the capacity to keep things in our heads. Um, and 
I, I think that um, that that's true of all technical developments. They introduce new possibilities that are positive, but they also have consequences that may be negative. And I think this um, is accelerated or or maybe um, amplified with the digital revolution, where technology largely stops being something that is on the same order as human sense experience and human perceptual experience and starts operating outside of our awareness, right? And I think that that leads to, um, you know, a kind of the kinds of disjunctions between um, he, human interests and technical interests or technical interests, let's say, in the service of corporations and other entities um, that are using them for specific purposes. And I guess I, I think my work is is about both um, paying attention to the negative effects. So ways in which humans are being made more precarious and being, you know, sort of uh, out of the made out of the loop of the system. Um, questions about, you know, labor practices that involve outsourcing labor to um, people in precarious situations, working, you know, in dangerous situations and so on. So all of those kinds of things. But of course, the reason I was drawn to the field is because I'm also fascinated by the potentials of media to, you know, distribute our cognitive abilities beyond what we can do um, and to, um, you know, open up possibilities for connectivity that weren't there before and so on. So I guess from my perspective, it's necessary to look at, you know, both the flourishing dimensions of technology and the the dimensions of technology that um, introduce um, problems for flourishing, at least of some parts of humanity. Thanks. Yeah. How does this look from the where you sit, Phil? Well, look, going back to the the two questions that were asked, I, you know, as I thought about myself, it does the technology allow me to flourish? I, I I I really tried to separate out the notion of flourishing from the notion of making my life easier, something making my life easier, and making my work easier, and making my research easier and more efficient. I wasn't going to equate that with flourishing, so I actually found myself. Not necessarily thinking, you know, having sort of straddled the sort of pre and post digital age as a scholar, I was like, okay, has my research gotten better? I don't know. That's uh, certainly gotten in some ways easier. Uh, and so I don't know if that necessarily, you know, equated with flourishing. So I would say I answered disagreed, slightly disagreeing in terms of whether I was able to flourish. Technology was allowing me to flourish. But then when I tried to take a step back and look at sort of sort of global trends and and, you know, larger, you know, historical trends, I felt more comfortable saying, you know, despite, despite the current moment, <laughs> that society as a whole, uh, you know, I agreed on that statement as a technology has allowed society to flourish within the broader sort of, you know, history of humanity. Yeah, from your uh, vantage point, Siobhan, um, how did those particular statements strike you uh, in terms of the things that you study? Um, yeah, so I, so for me personally, um, I'm no expert in flourishing. I have a toddler. I feel like I'm surviving. Um, but I, you know, um, for me personally, it's been huge. Um, I'm, I'm legally blind. And so technology allows me to access the world in a way that was not possible. Even when I was in high school, everything got, to, had to be enlarged on papers and even that used technology. Um, but computers have completely revolutionized how people with at least visual disabilities can engage in the world. Um, and then when I think about society, um, as someone who studies automation and robotics, I think it's a mixed bag. You know, I think that it's amazing in terms of like medical advances and things like this, um, but the effects are not even, um, access is not even, and um, how it works for different people is not, um, you know, equitable necessarily. And so I think how we use technology in the future and how we develop technology is is really important. Yeah, and uh, Nancy. Yeah, I was say personally, you know, as a, as a mental health professional, it's the my answer is kind of guided by the personal stories of other people that I have heard, and so it's been quite transformative for me to be able to conduct a parent group, for example, and be communicating with parents around the world. Right, who are who don't have access to mental health services, right, and are able to join with other parents and share their stories in a way that was you would never be imaginable, right? And those are very, you know, moving experiences. And then, you know, as the head of the Duke Center for Eating Disorders, you know, I always get to see the the bad side of media in terms of adolescents being negatively impacted 
by the things that they see and feeling compelled to follow um, videos that they watch and having kind of devastating and sometimes deadly consequences, right? So my answer to, to that one um, would, ha would, ha would, ha would have to be fringing on neutral because the positives are and then slightly, slightly disagree because those are such compelling images. Yeah, maybe just as a follow up for you, Nancy, um, how exactly would you define human flourishing with respect to mental health? And yeah, so you know, so I I always think of it um, as you know, th so there's the individual, and then there's the individual interacting with other people. And so when I when I think about human flourishing, um, you know, I, I think about uh, you know someone who is in terms of their their relationship with themselves, they are able to kind of tune into their bodies. They they know what they feel. They're not afraid of their emotions, right? They're able to kind of I know that I'm anxious, and I know that that what tells me I'm not trying to run away from my anxiety, and my anxiety doesn't get in my way. I can kind of channel it to to do those things, and so you just kind of feel safe. And that the the interpersonal part is that that you and your your you your authentic self is is witnessed by someone, mm -hmm. right? That there's someone out there in the world who kind of sees you as you are and really knows you, and so you feel like that you exist. And it's it's both of those pieces. And so, um, you know, so from a technology standpoint, one could see that. You know that there's lots, you know, lots of ways that technology can help us know know ourselves, and in terms of we, we can learn every intimate detail of our bodies, our heart rate, our you know, we can get our EKG, our pulse, all those things, kind of this intimate knowledge. And then there's the danger that you just are relying on the devices and not actually tuning in. I had this experience with one a dear friend of mine who, you know, we were at dinner and his watch beeped, and he was like, "Oh, I'm tired," you know, and I was like, you know. Oh, huh. well, that's something, um, you know, so and then, you know, of course, the witnessing part, you know, is that people can, you know, find, you know, a community where they just feel like there's people that just, you know, intimately understand their experience and, and perhaps could have never found, you know, this community. Um, and I think that that can be can be quite powerful. So a question for you, uh, Phil. Uh we're familiar with the way in which technology has essentially democratized uh, communication. Uh, do you think that, how has that contributed to human flourishing? And, and what are some ways also that it's posed some challenges? Sure. And so, you know, folks may be familiar with this notion, right, of where we say, you know, the democratization of communication. We're talking about the way in which digital technologies have put the ability to you know, be content creator and distributor, you know, the, you know, the phrase that we've heard for the past decade and a half. Now everyone is a journalist. Um, that's what we mean by the, you know, and, and sort of, you know, lowering the barriers to entry into, into, into these various communicative spaces. And so, you know, freedom of speech is not limited to only those who own a printing press, right? This, this is the way that communication has been democratized. Um, and we sort of have, you know, these, particular benchmark moments, right? Um, certainly the sort of expectations and the, uh, you know, optimism about the impact of a democratized communication environment. You know, early on, we could think about something like the Arab Spring. Uh, and when people said, look what this kind of more democratized communications environment can uh, achieve. Uh, and in many ways, you might argue that the Arab Spring gave us a sort of you know, sense of, of, you know, a bit of a distorted sense of what we should expect, because it was not long after the Arab Spring, but that, that those same technologies were being used to, you know, propagandize and surveil uh, those very same uh, activists who had, who had sort of made the Arab Spring possible. Uh, and then, of course, you know, today I, I, I struggle with sort of where democratization ends, and I don't think this is really a word, but I'm just going to create it now, anarchization begins right where where you know where are we where are we migrating from democracy to anarchy in terms of of these communicative spaces that we've created this you know the kind of global public sphere that we have now uh you know people who have been following the news have no doubt seen that you know as over the past year or so these you know our, our major digital platforms have for a variety of reasons been scaling back all of their investment in policing and content moderating their spaces and now uh, we have a moment like what's happened in uh, in Israel, where we're seeing, you know, just unbelievable amounts of disinformation 
flood this space uh, and, and with with consequences that, of course, can be far ranging. We certainly witnessed this with uh, with covid and saw that, you know, you know, these are there are life and death implications to how these new, much more democratized spaces are governed. Uh, and so, um, you know, from my standpoint, as someone who studies media and democracy, I, you know, I, I probably, you know, these days my pendulum is swinging in, in some pessimistic directions because I, I'm asking myself, is there some kind of sweet spot that we sort of swung past somewhere between, you know, 1995, 96, when the internet was first beginning to take off and, and now, uh, and can, you know, is there some happy medium that could be achieved here? You know, is there such a thing as too much democratization, which is you hate to, as somebody in a public policy school studying media and democracy, you hate to be asking that question, but I, but I am asking that question these days. Great. Let's hopefully we can uh, come back to that, but I want to ask Siobhan a question at this point. Um, can you, uh, given your research in robotics, can you reflect a little bit on, on robots, um, and how they have or will continue to affect our sense of flourishing? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, it's a, uh, there's a lot of different ways, you know, I think part of it is about access. And so, you know, when I did my research um, at the end of my PhD and still continue, um, it was about getting more access to medical care using robotics. Um, so I think many times robotics is only, you know, available for the elite and the big institutions. You think about these da Vinci systems for surgery, uh, but we were thinking about, you know, how could you expand access to ultrasound for scanning for cancers and things like this. Um, so I, I do think that it could help democratize access in a way that's really exciting. Um, you know, as someone with a visual disability, the idea of autonomous vehicles um, is really exciting. Um, but I think that with that, you know, you have this loss of control and you're completely changing how work is done. And so I think that's one of the big, you know, uh, issues with automation is, um, as you automate and as you increase technology, um, how do you how do you reformat how people work? Um, and you know how does governance work in these cases? Um, I think is really interesting. Um, but just some other examples of robotics and automation in medicine that you know I come in contact with a lot. Um, so you know there are ways, for instance, with charting. Um, you know, Epic. You know, I'm sure that maybe your doctor has complained about it. Um, but it has actually kind of separated the provider from the patient in terms of, you know, how much time it takes to fill out these charts. Um, but it also has been shown in some ways to catch some pretty important errors, right? Medication error and things like that when you can automate certain things, um, certain checks and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's it's a mixed bag. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about manufacturing jobs and how that's going to evolve over time, um, I think it's something that you have to prepare for. Um, because it, it will change the world. Um, the question is, how do we adapt to those changes? Great. Um, Mark, uh, may I ask, um, you know, how has media more generally, uh, Philip was talking about um, social media and, and journalism in particular, but, but media more broadly, how has um, that supported human flourishing through the ages and, and what are the prospects today? Yeah, um, well, like I was saying in my opening remarks, you know, I think the the history of media, you know, is it, it starts out with um, media and technology serving as a kind of, you know, extension of the human or a prosthesis for the human. So prosthesis for the human body with tools, the extension of the of man is obviously Marshall McLuhan's concept of media. And, you know, the way that I would see it historically is that then, um, you know, for for a long time, uh, experience was inscribed through language, right? Language was the kind of or medium or the privileged medium or the maybe the only medium, right? Um, because media is also a comparative concept and doesn't arise, at least from my perspective, until there are multiple ones. Um, language had a mon monopoly over the inscription of experience. And then with the development of technologies like um, film and, and the gramophone, you know, there was the possibility to inscribe uh, flows of experience without resorting to language, right? So, you know, um, film inscribing visual experience independently of language. So there's a kind of a, 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 a an increase in the possibility of extending and 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 um, recording our experience with those developments. But those developments still remain basically in sync with human experience, right? They're basically extensions of our memories, extensions of our ability to um, inscribe history and so on. 
And I think then with the development of, of digital media and, and there are obviously some precursors, um, you know, bureaucratic logics in the 19th century and so on, you know, what we see is a kind of disjunction between, well, a, a kind of break with that prosthetic um, the, um, imperative of technology, right? Where technology is no longer necessarily an extension of the body or an extension of the human, you know, in this direct way, but becomes something that can reorganize human experience, right, in ways that may not be in line with human flourishing and human experience. So I'm thinking of the way that algorithmic systems, for example, you know, parse human behavior, right? Um, and this is true on social media as well, right? Um, you know, algorithmic systems turn humans into data uh, profiles, right? And some data matters and some data doesn't, right? And those representations of humans on those um, platforms and in those algorithms, you know, do not correspond necessarily to human individuals, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that, you know, on the other hand, I guess I should also say there are interesting possibilities that come from this disjunction, right? And an example that I really like is the example of AlphaGo, right? So the, the computer that plays Go, right? This, um, this, this game of global strategy that is a very simple, apparently a very, seemingly a very simple game using just uh, little stones that are placed on a grid, but that is extremely complex, right? And in the the match uh, of the Korean grandmaster Lee Sedol in 2016 against AlphaGo, um, AlphaGo won, uh, you know, in the end. Um, and in the second um, game, AlphaGo made a move that was completely unexpected from the standpoint of the human. Right. And what happened then is that the human Lisa Dole studied this, you know, what happened in that game and then himself in the in the fourth game made a move that he himself couldn't have made on the basis of his own human associational properties. Right. So what I find exciting there is the idea that um, computers and computer processing may open new ways of thinking right beyond the human that are not necessarily against the human. Right. And it's really that that I'm interested in kind of trying to bring into play in thinking about, you know, sort of extended cognitive systems that involve both humans and, you know, computers in very complicated ways and in practical ways, um, some of which you've heard about from my colleagues. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Uh, Nancy, I wanted to ask a follow-up question uh, based on a remark that you made. You talked about the importance of human beings being known and understood and perhaps even loved by another. And I'm wondering, what does it mean when more and more of our communication is mediated by digital devices where people are less likely to pick up the phone and instead they want to text? They're less likely to get together in person, more likely to Zoom. Does digital mediation change the possibility of being known and loved, or is it just a channel by which we can continue to connect with one another as human beings? Yeah, that's such a good question. And, and kind of a, a, the fundamental question we're trying to parse out with Duke a little bit, right? So it's, you know, on, on the one hand, if someone is uh, texting, let's say someone you're texting someone that you don't even know, right? There's a degree of anonymity and we've seen the dangers of being anonymous, right? In terms of techno, you know, it, may, it brings out people's basis. Instant, they're not held accountable for, for bullying and things like that. And it's, it's most negative. But on a positive, right, it allows people who would be um, scared to connect, right, to, to be vulnerable with someone else, perhaps to kind of use the digital platform to kind of try it, to test out some things to see what it's like to have an exchange that would be more intimate than they would have the courage to do kind of in person and face. And so so it's that aspect of kind of our, you know, undergrad to undergrad communication that we're that we're playing around with. And um, it's fraught with challenges in, in terms of, you know, all of us have have sent a text message that kind of landed badly, right? You know, because the intention of our message was was missed without the context in which we were saying that we we're trying to be humorous and sarcastic and it just didn't land well. And so, you know, how we harness technology to be able to deliver, you know, the, the emotional intent of, of what we want to say is kind of a wide open for exploration. And so at the other extreme is, you know, chatbots um, delivering mental health services, right? So that you're actually, you know, someone suffering from depression and you're chatting. And on the other end of that chat is kind of, you know, to Mark's point about algorithms, right? It is an algorithmic response 
to your depression and, you know, can you actually feel witnessed by a chatbot? Um, you know, can you feel validated by a chatbot? You know, we don't know, right? You know, at the at, I, you know, my profession recoils at the notion, um, but it, but we just might need to grow, you know, to suck it up a little bit, you know, and, and that it that it may be possible. I will share one brief anecdote in which um, there was an eating disorder, um, a national eating disorder organization, who um, had a helpline um, where you know people could call in in distress for their eating disorder, and they. Um, Due to budget cuts, they kind of farmed out the response of this um, helpline to a chatbot, and you know, which learned algorithmically based on responses, adapted their responses based on what folks were calling in. And of course, people with eating disorders, like people with addiction, are um, are torn. You know, they're they're ambivalent about getting better, right? And so they're talking about dieting, you know, things that are harmful to them. And it didn't take long for the chatbot to be giving diet advice to people calling into the helpline, which which shut down the helpline quite rapidly, I would say. Um, Siobhan, um, building off of that just a little bit, uh, this may be a little speculative, but you've told us a little bit about um, automated vehicles and surgical robots and industrial automation uh, and job loss. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the prospect of robots as companions or friends or assistants. Um, what do you see coming around the corner? How close are we to that? Um, and what are the prospects for being aided by um, or being emotionally connected to uh, non-human robots? Mm, yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, so I will say that um, there are some robots that are designed for this. Um, you know, there are some robots that are, for instance, designed to be like pets um, that are used for people with Alzheimer's, you know, who can't physically, you know, who can't take care of pets in the same way. Um, and these companion systems, you know, in some cases work really well. I mean, you know, and it's, you know, I mean, it, it is a companion system. Um, in terms of replicating humans, um, I, I don't know if, you know, some people here have had some uh, chance to talk to chat GPT, um, but I, the large language models are getting a lot better um, in a really surprising way. They're also bad in other ways. Um, they're not they're always very accurate and they're very confident. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea that they could chat with you, I think, you know, as um, Nancy said, is very reasonable. The idea that they would accidentally tell you uh, diet advice when you have an eating disorder. Not surprising, um, you know. So I think that there's a lot to be done um, to kind of make them effective and, and you know, in a way that would help us flourish and not famine, you know. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I think that the more simplistic devices um, for companionship, like pets, to me seem a lot more feasible in the near future. I definitely think there will be very large attempts at. Um, real, you know, chatbots that are more like for companionship that are more human-like in the future. Um, I will say that it's a lot easier to do in terms of language models and, um, you know, and kind of on the that side of it versus the physical side. Um, physical robotics is has a lot to catch up with. Um, so uh, there'll be, it'll be a long time before you're running into a robot and think you're running into a friend. The Jetsons is not quite our future yet. Not uh, yet. Phil, let me ask you a question. Um, one of the things I think about with communication technology is whether it enables um, or facilitates, makes easier the kind of communications we used to have, which is for most people to talk to their friends and relatives and neighbors. One of the things that happened with uh, social media is that it made our audience the entire world. Um, how do you think that change is not just maybe a change of uh, quantity, but a qualitative change? Like how how does that how does that change the equation for uh, enabling human flourishing that everyone can speak to the entire globe instantaneously? Sure, uh, you know, there's obviously very you know prominent prominent positives and negatives here, right? If we think about how that ability has facilitated in numerous cases, right? You know, massive instances of social injustice sort of becoming, you know, you know, you know, making the public aware, right? That those are those are 
you know, those are in particular moments, right? Whether it's the, you know, the killing of George Floyd or, you know, we could name various others uh, that, you know, were captured and were able to go viral uh, on social media, uh, you know, and and had, you know, profound implications, right? So that's, you know, that's that's one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum is the, you know, colleague of mine, you know, as he put it once, you know, Facebook as narcissism engine that, you know, that this sudden ability to to reach audiences you could not reach before somehow convinces you that everybody needs to see a picture of the of the breakfast you had this morning. Uh, or, you know, and so, you know, that, you know, items of, of, of no consequence. Right. And so we have and that, though, is the challenge. Thing. We've we have a platform where things of immense consequence and things of m- no consequence are all part of the same feed. Uh, and then it is incumbent upon us as end users to really develop this new skill set to differentiate between items of consequence and items of, of no consequence. Certainly the algorithmic systems are are trying to, to do that as well, but they're really doing it within the context of trying to determine what is of consequence or no consequence to me individually, right? So um, not, you know, what's been lost in this in this model unfortunately i think it's is some notion of 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 the public interest of the public good where you know what are the normative values that guide these efforts to uh distinguish between items of consequence and no consequence for us you know the famous example that happened uh, you know you know facebook changed its algorithm at one point to sort of more prominently feature posts that were achieving high levels of engagement that is lots of comments feedbacks likes shares what have you and I can't remember which European political party li- reached out to Facebook and said, you are literally compelling us to make our messaging more extreme uh, and, and more polarizing, because that's the kind of messaging that's generating the engagements that then is generating the visibility. Uh, and, and so to think about that, right, to think about that, how, how you know, that perverse feedback loop, uh, that those kinds of things are happening within the dynamics of these of, of these global reach platforms. Wonderful. This has been a, a great uh, conversation. Uh, we want to give you um, in the audience an opportunity to engage with these faculty. Um, Mark, Philip, Siobhan, and Nancy, thank you so much for your thoughtful discussion. And before we end today, I want to give each of our panelists an opportunity to answer one last question. Same question for each of them. And the question is, what is one last thing you want our audience to walk away with after this conversation? Some closing word or thought. Uh, that you would like to leave people with. And we'll start with uh, Mark. I, I wanted to say this when we were talking about robots, right? But there are robots, you know, sort of um, robots for the elderly in Japan, right? They have a quite advanced um, program of robots. And these are very simple robots. They don't do much, right? And the idea is that the way that they work is that people sort of endow them with emotional qualities, right? Just like, you know, the early experiments with Eliza, right? The online psychologist, right? Um, people... You know, it's 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 us lending them, you know, the the humanness that we have that creates the the relationship. And I think that we need to remember that all of the data that machine learning systems and algorithmic systems work on, all of the data that circulated on social media is human data, right? Which is why it reproduces all of the biases that human social life has and so on and so forth. But I think remembering that also prevents us from going into the position of thinking that AI and machine learning and these technologies is something that against our interests, right? Something that will, you know, surpass us, replace us, threaten us, annihilate us, which is a lot of the discourse that, you know, is in is in popular culture, but also, you know, in statements by tech executives, for example, right? So I think it's really important to remember that the human is human and human life and human social life is at the core of all of this stuff, you know, including the toxic stuff, right? And what that does is it keeps alive the idea that we can do things to change it, we can do things to influence it, that it will never be autonomous in some absolute way from us. Thank you. Uh, Siobhan? Yeah, I would say to follow up on that, um, you know, I think that technology and how it develops is not neutral. I think that's a really important thing that it affects us all very differently, Um, but also we have huge effects on how it affects us personally. And so I think just taking a, you know, chance to think, you know, how does it feel to be on my phone for however much it is every day, um, I think can really help flourishing in the long run. 
Thank you. Uh, Nancy, do you have a closing comment? Just say if, you know, if everyone, um, you know, would just pause once a day and just think about, you know, what, how can I communicate with the person on the other end of the line so that that person knows that I'm actually really listening, right? So that we're kind of act, um, potentiating the effects of connection. Thank you. And Phil, we'll give you the last word. Sure. I think, I think I'd actually want to reemphasize a point I made at the outset, which is, you know, life being made easier and flourishing are not the same. There's certainly some overlap, but when we ask ourselves what, you know, the role technology is playing in our lives, I think we should oftentimes ask more of it than to just make our life easier, that we should, you know, we, 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 we're, we're allowed to expect more and should expect more. Excellent. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for a great session. Thanks to our audience for joining us today for these rich conversations and continuing to challenge ourselves to think more deeply about how we engage with our digital world and that we might flourish as individuals, as communities, and as a society.